the marinade. There's no O in marinade. Let's try it one more time. Ready? One, <laughs> two, three. <laughs> the marinade. <laughs> marrow. Marrow. Marinade. Marrow. Bone marinade. The marinade. The marinade. With Jason Earl. Jason Earl, a free-flowing conversation about the creative process with creative people. This is episode 44, and our guest is Melody Walker. Melody is the principal songwriter and lead singer for the band Front Country. Uh, Melody writes powerful songs and then sings them with a powerful voice, one that, as you'll see in the, in the course of this conversation, is connected to uh, an incredible mind. We caught up with Melody at Swanee Roots Revival 2019 at Spirit of the Swanee Music Park in Live Oak, Florida, our happy place. This is uh, the first of three um, really wonderful episodes, wonderful conversations that we recorded this year at Swanee. I can't wait for y'all to hear the the next two as well. We returned with Verlin Thompson and Seth Walker. And uh, I'm just so excited, not only for those conversations, but then to to go back to Swanee in the spring and bring y'all some more really wonderful talks you can get a copy of front country's most recent record other love songs at frontcountryband.com we cover a lot in this episode this is one of the longer ones uh, because melody was just so delightful and had so much to say Um, and it's just so smart that i i didn't want to cut anything really um i even left in like a couple of kind of silly moments that i may have normally cut out but uh she's just so great and um and i think that um, this episode flows really, really well despite its length. If if Front Country's coming to your town, y'all, don't miss their live show. Um, just so dynamic, as I talk about during this episode. Everyone, without further ado, uh, it is my distinct honor to present my conversation with Melody Walker. Ah, right. yeah, yeah, and it's a little bit Fair sensitive. Enough. Melly, thank you so much. This yeah. is a, an honor. Ever since the um, when I interviewed John Stickley here, like uh, two years ago, and you happened to be, we took over your dressing room, actually. Yeah, and I don't know actually whose dressing room. I was probably, I do this thing when I'm at festivals. I just like find a place where I can uh, like get ready, like maybe yeah. uh, curl my hair if it's messy or uh, yeah, do yeah. some makeup. I think that's exactly changed. what you were doing. I think you were curling your hair in the corner while we were talking. Yeah. But it might have been John's dressing room. I, don't I actually so. don't know. Or we were like switching places on the dressing room. Yeah. Uh, I actually did it. I did it yesterday, and uh, yeah, I I was trying to trying to curl my hair, and um, this lady told me that this one trailer was like a common trailer. It was all good. Oh, uh, cool. But it did say Del McCurry on the outside. <laughs> uh, but I took her word for it. I went in there, and I tried to get curling my hair but the socket wasn't working which totally lucked out for me because 
because I like, you know, got my curly hair and like forgot my stuff and I was going off to get s like somewhere else and who walks in? <laughs> Del McCurry. There was nothing in the trailer, like nobody's stuff or anything. There was no like rider, there was no snacks or anything like that. So I was like, okay, this seems like maybe this was Del trailer last night or something. Yeah, you know, yeah. they just didn't take this out. No, it was definitely Del's trailer. Del's just middle like, on his rider, oh, I guess. He he sort of knows me. He knows I'm in the scene. I okay, think he, all right. he probably does not know my name. Yeah. But yeah. nor should he. Um, right, right. but I just said, oh, hi, Del. I'm yeah. just leaving now. Yeah, I feel like Del McCree doesn't owe anybody anything at this point, right? Like, he's yeah, he's no, given us... he doesn't. <laughs> and he doesn't deserve, like, some freaking, you know, chick in his <laughs> trailer trying to do her hair. So I'm glad I wasn't, like, fully getting into doing my hair and makeup. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was uh, a near miss. Well, I'm glad that you dodged that bullet. And ever since that moment, though, that... Uh, you ended up in the conversation, and I can't. I meant to go back and listen to it because I can't remember what we were talking about. You ended up jumping I never in the conversation. To the, to the episode either. Oh, really? I really need to. Yeah, it's it's a good one. I mean, John's awesome, you know. But I think I was just heckling, probably. I can't remember. I think I think it it got ended up being like him saying something, self-deprecating or something, mm -hmm. and then you jumping in and being like, "No, you idiot! You know, you're amazing." Or I don't remember, but it, it doesn't matter because oh, you yeah. ended up playing right after that. In that moment, I was like, "All right, next time she's in the same place that I am, I got to get her on the show because that your live performance is just overwhelming. Oh, is the energy the 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 thing that like blows me away, and it comes through on record too. Um, but the live but the live performance, there's a little bit extra. It feels like to me, maybe because I'm there and I'm in the moment. No, I agree. It's like you it's know? so hard to capture that on a record. So we, hard. Yeah, the live thing. That's what we live for. It, so. It's amazing, and and it's just like there's the that that um, that authenticity that songwriters are so often you know tasked with creating, right? Like honesty, the truth. It comes through so strongly in your writing and in your singing, and so I was like that moment at Swanee that's been two years now I guess but I was like next time we're in the same place we got to make this happen thanks, dude it's a blessing and a curse because mm. uh I don't know if you know this but being truthful all the time mm. it doesn't make you a popular person uh, uh -huh. um I'm learning how to be more diplomatic yeah in my life if I had to guess like what my like life you know what my like karma or whatever is you know like what like the thing that I'm here to figure out this time. Yeah. I don't even know if I believe in reincarnation. Whatever. Let's right, just go right. with it. We could go down um, that road if you want. We can totally go there. <laughs> um, you know, if if that's real, then what I'm trying to learn this time, I think, is like, you know, diplomacy, slowing down impulsi uh -huh. impulsivity, <laughs> you know, Wha like finding compassion uh, even in a world where things are shitty. Yeah. Am I allowed to curse on this podcast? You can fucking curse okay. all you goddamn want. Um, yeah, we can. You can say anything. The, the only my only rule is uh, that it can't be um, like racist or sexist, and I'm not worried about that with you. This is a good rule. Wait, <laughs> as long, we don't believe in reverse sexism, right? I can still say men are trash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's just an objective <laughs> fact. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go there. I'm just gonna say that because um, it's a feminist issue that. Um, if you say that on Facebook, you'll get like banned. You yeah, know? yeah. Like, because like Facebook is like reverse sexism and racism is, is real, and you're yeah. like, no, it's not. That's not the same thing right. at all. It's a completely different context. Like, right. Because like all of the powers in the world, exactly. The whole government, the whole structure, the whole system, is not also supporting. When I say men are trash, yeah. Like people, that system doesn't doesn't support that right that's like a, a revolutionary thing for me to say that's against like the grain right of like the way that oppression generally flows at least in our society yeah and um maybe if we were living on a amazonian you know isle of lesbos situation like a like a wonder woman situation yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah. maybe men really <laughs> would be oppressed and then it would be really crappy for me to say that yeah. but um that's not the world that we live in and um I hope that men out there know that I don't actually believe all men are trash. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> saying that because people say that I'm not allowed to say that. Uh, and if no. anyone can, uh, I think, resonate with and appreciate 
um, free speech yeah. and my ability to say that, yeah. um, it would be the people who get offended when you say men are trash right, because they right. love free speech. They're like, <laughs> my free speech. <laughs> and you're like, okay, my free speech, men are trash. And then they get pissed off yeah, yeah. and then they can't handle it. Um, so, um, yeah, I would love a world in which um, all speech is totally free and equal. Yeah. That would be wonderful. So We're all working toward the same goal here. Right. So how does that... You were talking just a second ago about the idea of like being more diplomatic, um, working on being diplomatic. Oh, I fucked that up, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> and then you Whoops. immediately were not diplomatic. No, but that, but you're working on it. That's okay, I'm right? Working on it. Um, and and the fact and, and what you said. I mean, everything you said is, I think, just true. So I, I'm not, you know, I don't think. The, the fact that you're being diplomatic doesn't mean that you're going to stop telling the truth, right? Like diplomacy doesn't mean um, bullshitting, right? It, it means it yeah, means ideally. trying to find common ground. And, it's, and it mm-hmm. is hard in a polarized world, right? Mm-hmm. And it is especially hard right now when it's so thrust in our face by, I mean, the, the president of the United States, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's constant. And I think that that makes it more difficult to recognize how much common ground is being found in the world because the images that we're seeing constantly you mentioned social media right Mm -hmm. um that we're constantly seeing and shoved in our faces again and again and again is one of not not is not a diplomatic it's a more adversarial kind of world so what do you do to work on that what does that look like it's so hard right because you want to just react yeah and you want to just be like you know like fuck trump and yeah 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 like you you want to like respond in kind with the same kind of thing. But I think, I think we all kind of know like that, that the antidote to hate is not more hate. It's love. Right, I'm yeah. not being a centrist here, obviously. Like yeah, I think yeah. you figured that out already. Yeah, yeah. But, but there, that has to be true on some level that yeah. like, you know, that so many centrists like to like throw in your face, the MLK quote of like, you know, like that, darkness can't drive out darkness only light can do that sure um and i think that does have to be true on some level um but i think the way that the way that i think about that is actually just about like being effective in tactics Mm -hmm. like is it effective for me to respond you know with hatred to hatred is that actually effective like sometimes i think it can be effective to be like bombastic in your language and to be passionate Uh um But I think at least on a human to human level, which is so hard to navigate in the social media world, Mm -hmm. uh, because like it's like human on a computer to human on a computer, which adds this layer of just like inhumanity where Mm -hmm. we're not our best selves and we're not treating each other the best way. Um, I think that on a human to human level, you have to have that compassion and you have to have that that rapport and those kind of interactions, I think, are best done kind of in private, you know? Yeah. And I've tried to do more work of, like, getting into DMs with people mm. when there is a rapport. It does not work to do that if right. you don't know somebody well. Oh, interesting. If they have no respect for you. But if it is somebody that you know well and you see them fuck up yeah. online and say something stupid, say something that is, like, y- that you know isn't even in their heart, yeah. you know? That's, like, you know them and you know that they're better than that. Right. Like... I think that it's better to sort of call them in, as they say, you know, instead of call out culture, everybody decries call out culture, like Mm -hmm. calling in is where you're like, hey, what's up? Like, we're friends. Like, like, I understand where you're coming from there, but I don't think that that's like how you really feel. Right. Because like I know you and you're super cool Mm -hmm. and I wouldn't be talking to you about this if I didn't think that you were a good person right. who is better than what you said. Right. Right. Like that. I think that that's like the key is like when I've been called out, I just know like I've been called out on shit. I've learned so much over the last few years, like mm. with this like accelerated pace of like social media, social justice, you uh-huh. know, yeah. I've learned so much myself and, and some of it was through being called out uncomfortably. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Some of it was through being called out, called in by friends. Um, and, you know, even if I reacted badly at first to it, kind of with my ego, you know, sure. Um, I sort of got the message. Sometimes people told me that this was why, but like I also got the message eventually it sank in that 
they wouldn't be approaching me about this and telling me to do better if they didn't think that I could do better and that I was like worth more than that you know right. what I mean that they wouldn't be if they thought I wasn't reachable they wouldn't even reach out you know what I mean so like it, yeah. it means a lot like I had a friend call me out on using the term spirit animal uh, you know uh, to talk about like oh this like music this band is my spirit animal shit, I wouldn't or whatever have, that wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought a thing I about know, it and it's a thing that like happens a lot in like festy culture a lot yes like, people are you know I was I was at Floyd Fest and they had their like logo and theme for the year. I think the past couple years was this dream catcher that said a tribe called Floyd Fest or Whoa, something. Yeah, I think that's uh -huh. what it said. Um, and like using the word tribe too is like I've come to find is like, you know, offensive to First Nations people, Native Americans, and yeah. um, because we don't respect the concept of like the tribe, like the actual tribe. Right. We don't learn about actual tribal culture. Right. We just want to be like, Oh, my hippie friend tribe. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, and that's not cool. Like that's not being respectful to that. And like, you know, there's plenty of hippies who have gone, gone deep with native American culture. And I think, I think if you have done that and you've been in spaces with and been silent and learned from native American people, right. Maybe, you can have a way into that, you know, but I don't think most people are using tribe or spirit animal, especially in these sort of like meme -y ways, you know, yeah, uh -huh. of like, oh yeah, my entrepreneurial business tribe yeah. of <laughs> like-minded, you know, yoga chicks. Like <laughs> this isn't, this is not what that is. And right, like right, using right. tribe is like, you're better than that. Like y'all yeah. are people who are supposedly compassionate. Yoga is about compassion and like yeah. awakening. Like, be more woke then <laughs> you know yeah. you could be more woke than that so i had a friend just call me out like just real chill uh like on instagram dm you know and was yeah. like hey like you know that word spirit animal is like you know we don't use that anymore it's considered disrespectful you know like there's certain native american cultures that have the concept of spirit animals or spirit guides and there's like you know this deep culture of that and like using it for something like your favorite band or your favorite makeup product <laughs> or whatever yeah, it is, you know, your yeah. favorite thing is like really cheapening it. And also just part of the colonial history of like trivializing and just like taking from, you know, native peoples, indigenous cultures, just taking whatever you want and using yeah. it however you want. Right? right. That's like what, that's what that is. Yeah. So, you know, like if we can just not just like be the, that colonial taker yeah. of indigenous culture, that would be like a really good start to right. just doing better, you know? And I yeah. think that like it's the hardest to talk about this sometimes with, you know, white hippie folks. Yeah. Who consider themselves to be like really kind, mm -hmm. good, you know, gentle people, you know? And um, in R in, in most cases, in most cases. You yeah. Know? Sometimes that can be. <laughs> whoa. <shit>. Whoa. <laughs> Chris is B. Ah! Is he gone? I don't know. Fucker. Okay, so crazy. Outside. Okay. okay. I'm not, not a fan. Not a fan of Maybe bees. Like, I'm this learning. Like a flower too. That okay. is. Okay. Uh, we've learned. What else are you not? Uh, what else scares you? <laughs> oh yeah. Bees are nopes. Spiders are nopes. I got bit by some fire ants yesterday at this festival. That was great. Are you going to keep the bee part in? Was Probably. That, like, production value? Okay. It yeah. Fine. It's, it depends on I thought you were my how you feel about it. <laughs> a and B, how funny it is when I listen to it again. I want to hear like what that yelp was like. Um, anyway, um, what were we talking about? Well, oh, I, I taking was from Native American. Yeah. Oh, hippie people yeah. being like gentle kind he's he's around but we're Is just gonna he? stay okay. still um, maybe he'll like me uh being like gentle kind people who like really mean well and it's like yeah. but if your construction of yourself aka the ego right is I am this gentle, kind soul, positive vibes only man yeah, like yeah, uh -huh. white light white light white yeah, light yeah, yeah. like if that's like covering up for some dark shit that you're not dealing with like uh -huh. you are not gonna react well if somebody asks you to like live up to those ideals in a way that is like out of your comfort zone. Right. Yeah, like, uh -huh. and I've seen it like a million times, you know, and like there's this book white fragility by Robin D'Angelo. I've heard about um, that. It's amazing. Okay. Um, and she like says straight up kind of like in the intro, like white progressives are the worst. 
Uh huh. Because they think that they're like post racial and so woke already. Yeah. And I can so relate to that because I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah. And I grew up in this like land where it's like, oh yeah, we've been cool and politically correct forever. You right. know, like we've we've like tackled racism and all this stuff. It's so silly, but like yeah. that is the like the the sort of baseline assumption with like a place where there's a bunch of liberals. And I don't think that I don't think it's really true. Um, and I think that there's a lot more sort of like nuanced, low grade, implicit bias. Yeah. That like a lot of progressives have just not done the work to unpack at all. Yeah. And have built up this whole construction of themselves as being good people, politically active, yeah. you know, like right. progressive people. And and if you like challenge that in any way or ask them to do some work on it, sometimes it can be like really reactive. Right. And um, I've been trying to like actually do my work. Um, and I don't think it's a, a coincidence that it coincided with me moving from California to Nashville, mm. Tennessee, moving to the South. Something I thought I would never, ever yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. I'm from California. I'm from the Bay Area. It's bubble. Yeah. You know, I lived in like way Northern California in Humboldt County for a while. And it's just like bubbles of like progressiveness, you know. Right. Um, and I did, though, because Nashville's cheaper. So I moved there and sort of found that the whole conversation about, like, racism and stuff was a lot more real mm -hmm. to people. Like, was more, like, just in, in people's face, just in a different way yeah. in the South. You know, like, I am in no way, by the way, saying that, like, racism does not exist in the Bay Area because clearly it does, right. you know, and there's tons of implicit bias and there's a lot of people not working on their shit. But in the South, people have been working on their shit in a different way yeah. for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And, like, white allies, I think, are very different in the South and in mm -hmm. Nashville. Um, and the progressives that I met going to, like, protests during this whole, like, Trump thing. We moved literally the year that Trump got elected. Yeah. Which was, like, immediate regret. <laughs> 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 not really, but I was like, oh, wow, we live, like, yeah. in a blue dot in a red sea. Yeah. Like, that red sea feels a little more charged and scary now. Yep. And, um, and... So I, I started going to some protests, though, and meeting people. And these, like, Southern progressive activists just have so much heart. Yeah. And they've been just, like, banging their heads against this wall forever. Like, yeah. they they really actually have something to fight for instead of, like, the Bay Area where it's just, like, always preaching to the choir. Right. You know? It's a different vibe. And I wanted I, to I really ask you about it. that. Yeah, because I, cause I was... That's I'm so glad you went into all of that because I think sometimes... I live in Orlando, and Orlando is a blue dot in a red sea yeah. as well. Like, it's a... It's a very progressive place, really. I mean, especially compared to its surroundings, right? So, um, and my friends are all pretty like-minded, yeah. you know? And so the conversation, I almost, I'm guilty of avoiding conversations because because to me there there's like a sticking point. I think we can have reasonable discussions about foreign policy and to disagree. I think we can have reasonable discussions about economics and healthcare and disagree and come to different um, solutions about what policy is best. I don't think there's any wiggle room for um, racism. I don't think there's any wiggle room for, um, you know, being uh, anti, I don't like the word homophobia because it's, I, I think it's misleading, but like a being against gay people in some way, yeah. not supporting the rights of people to be people, right? And be who they are. I don't think there's wiggle room there. That's like, where the rubber meets the road. I don't honestly. have any, I don't have any wiggle room, but the problem is if I go home to my hometown, which is an hour and a half north of Orlando, those are the conversations that people are still having. They're still they will look you in the face and tell you that they think black people are inferior. They will look you in the face and tell you that they think that um, only a man and a woman should be able to get married. And there's where I just don't like the diplomacy breaks down. Yeah. Right. So like I was wondering about that as you were talking about it, because I'm wondering coming from San Francisco and then being a musician, most of the people you're around, I would guess are probably like minded. So how often other than on online, how often are you face to face with somebody that maybe you completely disagree with and and are you able to be diplomatic in those moments? I feel like I am more face to face with those folks since I've been since I moved to Nashville, since I've been touring a lot. Uh -huh. Our band started out 
much more bluegrassy mm-hmm. than we are now and much more in that scene and we've played some bluegrass festivals mm-hmm. in the southeast um where i have definitely encountered these things you know and i'd say for the most part i get the sense that people hide it mm-hmm. from the pink haired chick singer <laughs> you know, they're like she's not gonna be down with this so we're just gonna hide this yeah yeah um but yeah more and more and i think with the trump administration yeah i think people are much more outward about it right you know for sure um so i had an experience um just a couple of weeks ago uh-huh. um at a festival in the uk it was a country music festival in the uk so it had like the headliners were all like pop country acts and then it had some like you know americana stuff it had like a sleep at the wheel it had us um and and it was a really cool festival. It was beautiful. I was hanging backstage, uh-huh. and I went to get some tea, a builder's tea, as they say, nice and strong tea to try to get something similar caffeination to coffee because the coffee is all trash in the U.K. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, I don't know if you got any U.K. listeners, but you know it's true. We do. Costa's yeah. trash. We do have a few. Um, anyway, um, so I was getting a tea, builder's tea, as they say, um, and I went and sat down in the like catering tent backstage, and I was sitting alone at this table, and then there was a whole table uh, in the middle between me and these other guys that was, like, um, all these, like, you know, roadies and, like, you know, all dressed in black, like, kind of younger, like, millennials. And then across that table from them, there were these old cats from Nashville um, who were clearly the crew of one of these pop country headliner dudes. Yeah. Um, I won't say who. Sure. Um but it was just like three of them and they were sitting there and they were like being so loud they were running their mouths like the most obnoxious version of southern americans that you could possibly think of yeah just like representing yeah for america in the uk you know there's like there's like people who are running the festival you know go around this catering tent and stuff and like Oh, also the sleep at the wheel guys were like at a table like far at the other end of the catering tent, like, and they're these old Austin hippies, you yeah, know, like, yeah, yeah. and they're just chuckling at this whole thing. Um, but I listen for a while, you know. Sometimes you just listen in, and right. you're like, all right, what is this? What is this shit? And <coughs> you know, they're going off about like, they're going off about like, uh, oh, well, the, you know, I don't know why people hate Trump. You know, the economy is just doing so good. You know, like unemployment rates so good, <sighs> and just Jesus. talking about like. Wow, he's really done some good things, you know, and like, you know, this border thing and just talking about how great the wall is. And then and then and then they start talking about how I can't believe that people say that Trump is racist. Like, what does that even mean? You know, like um, and I'm like sitting back here like I'm starting to kind of my blood is like starting to boil. getting caffeinated (laughs) and and this table of like millennial uh, folks who were I came to find out the crew for this like younger country pop star who's super woke and cool who I love uh um, named Cam I'm just gonna put that out there nice nice Um, she's super cool Um, awesome and it was she wasn't there but it was her whole crew yeah and uh, they were just like seething and they were just like silently listening and like trading looks with me and like just like pissed and I I just decided to say something okay yeah all right I got up I sort of approached their table I got my coffee, my, my tea, I mean, and I'm, like, trying to get caffeinated, and I'm, like, shaking. And you threw it on and one of them. No, I, no, no. I oh. don't assault people. Okay, okay. I mean, I I do sympathize with Antifa, but I'm not probably going to be, like, <laughs> throwing a punch, but uh, we can talk about that one next. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I'm not a puncher myself, right. but I support your right to punch <laughs> Nazis. Um, uh, <clears throat> these guys were just Nazi sympathizers, okay? Yeah. And, and you know, you I was say? talking about, like, well... I was talking to them about why Trump is like actually racist, like yeah. the racist things that he's said and done. How so you're giving them specifics. How his daddy was, you know, involved with the KKK in New York yeah. and was, you know, like did housing discrimination and right. like how like racism really does run deep for Trump. It's not like he's just this New Yorker. They were trying to make this case, you know, that he's this like cosmopolitan businessman and he can't be racist. And it's like, yeah. no, this runs really deep with his family actually. And like, yeah. And it's, I think it's actually a sincere part of who he is. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and it's not yeah, just campaign so stuff. We talked for a while though about all kinds of different things. Um, good. And, and it was good. And I just felt good that I like 
actually said something and like challenged their i can't remember all the things that we talked about how, how did they receive it you know they were like they i don't think that i got through to them at all really. was it just you i was you trying to be yourself? diplomatic but i was just standing up to the points that they had made that were just so wrong you yeah, know? yeah they had made all these points that were like really fox news lies right right and you know and so we were, we were just talking about that. And I <laughs> actually said to my dad the other day, he was saying something ridiculous about about Trump. And, and my dad wakes up in the morning. He's in his 70s. He wakes up in the morning, and he sits down in front of his TV, and he watches Fox News pretty much all day. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I mean, he's legitimately brainwashed. Like, he is. Have you heard about parental controls on the television? <laughs> Do they listen to this podcast? I'm sorry if I'm blowing your cover. You can edit um, this out if you want to. No. But uh, uh, this is a thing that people really are listen. doing, man. Like, yeah. Get on the folks' TV. You know they don't know how to work that shit. I know. And he use would, the parental controls against the parentals. I know. He would call in somebody eventually. Yeah, but for a while there, maybe you could get through. Yeah. Maybe. It's but worth it because I do think that constant brainwashing is just it's so, so bad. toxic. It is. And I, I said, I actually, I stupidly actually use the word brainwashing with him see that's that's the kind of thing like with the diplomacy right yeah like, like there are things that you could say that just turn people off to the conversation yeah he just because of course yeah. he, he's a he's an accomplished person right he used to be very reasonable and so and he was an elected politician and he was a republican but he was like a very compassionate republican who was pretty central was pretty centrist in his in like his Reagan-y. policies just a cuddly Reagan Republican. Oh, he was God, what, what what wouldn't we give for one of those <laughs> right about now? Even though that guy was fucked. Yeah, that guy was that guy wasn't the best. Uh, I can't think of a good example, unfortunately, of someone that that is centrist. That's a famous Republican. For some reason, I'm really struggling to think of that. But but anyway, he he's just come so far because of all of the propaganda that he's watching on Fox News. And I've tried to explain to him like this isn't a news organization. Was he into John McCain? Is that a good example? Yeah, that's a good example. He wasn't a John McCain. Was he into when Trump literally dragged a dead John McCain? Like, like what did he think of that? It's the, like, the, did the, you like John McCain? The, like, how can you? The, the explanation that he and other people uh, like him would say, pe- the Trump supporter would say is, yeah, I didn't agree with that. And then they just move on. Like, yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's just like, it doesn't matter what the guy does. Yeah, yeah. You can just be like, yeah, he probably shouldn't have said that. Or what? Like when he mocked the him, the reporter, right? Yeah. It was just like, Dad, watch this video real quickly and tell me that this person should be the president of the United States. He's like, yeah, yeah, he probably shouldn't have done that. And you, you could have a list of a hundred things, and still, if your if your mind is completely warped to the point where it, there just there is no, I can't present enough evidence. You know, it's like even comparatively when you're like, what did Bill Clinton get impeached for? Yeah, I'm not saying that's right. Like, yeah, yeah, he yeah. absolutely was a numbskull who freaking like abused his power yeah. in a crappy way that we understand now is not really in line with our standard of consent. Right. right? Like, right. even though I think everyone was adults in the situation, it was just like a shitty, unethical way to right. have sex. Yeah. Um, so like that happened i don't stand by that but i think it was just such a lower bar than everything that trump has done yeah. and what he's like you know about to be impeached for yeah. hopefully a broad scale impeachment and not just the ukraine thing because like yeah i really think everything else will just go down the memory hole if we don't well it's it's wild to me that and then i want to ask you about your process because we <laughs> oh it's all good we can just talk politics <laughs> we can um the because I, like i remember when uh, so he gets elected 2016 mm-hmm. um 2017 comes around 2017 when your record drops i'll slowly get get us back there um and in what was it july i guess james comey is investigating him for potential his campaign's ties to russia and he fires the man trump fires the person who is investigating him and that and if obama did that can you imagine oh my god heads would explode like I, I, anything if obama did like one fraction of any one of the single things that Trump has done. Unbelievable. The man wore a tan suit. <laughs> do you remember this? I do. Like, literally. He didn't have an American flag 
lapel pin oh, once. Oh, no flag pin, right. Nobody put the, his like, feet up on the, the desk. fascist symbol that came into vogue after 9-11, oh, as we dude. all remember. Yeah. As we all remember, George Bush, not our friend. George W. Bush, <laughs> not our friend. <laughs> yeah. As some people seem to be forgetting, yeah. you know? Well, it's crazy because the com- the juxtaposition of those two, you're like, man, I I I, I know I what I wouldn't for give for George W. Yeah. Bush. But I can go for the he was a war crime. war criminal. <laughs> Literally. Uh, well, and so then was Obama, too, though. I mean, that's another thing that... You know, I, to- I think oh, totally. I agree you know, with you. I think that's an important point overall is that these are bad people yeah. and we should not trust them. Right. Like that. It sh- you should hold them accountable for their mm-hmm. actions and to lionize them or to in some way think that they are going to save us from something or yeah. that they are someone that we should um, almost. I mean, it borders on worship. It happens with, with Obama, too. Yes. Um, it, that's not healthy. Yeah, totally. And I think that, you know, people are always decrying the purity politics of the left, right? Yeah, yeah. That we, like, demand more. But I actually think that the way that we get, that we got into this situation and the way we get out of it is actually through that, is by, like, using our morals and our our actual ethics of, like, the democratic side of things, whatever, two-party politics is fucked, but, like, of the left side of the spectrum, like, we should use that to our strength and not let it keep being a weakness for us and i think the way that we actually use it as a strength is to hold our own accountable is to hold everybody accountable by the same standards to talk about how obama was really just carrying on a lot of the george w bush foreign policy that Mm -hmm. was so toxic accelerated a lot of it too yes he did and Mm -hmm. drone warfare it's like it's sick that we like aren't talking about that and i actually think that that that's the way right like that's the way like when you do a human to human call in Mm -hmm. and you're like i'm fucked up too you know i've made mistakes like you take some ownership of your own shit and you're like and that's why i know that you can do better that's why i know that we can all do better and make a better world together yep and i don't think that just falling in line like the republicans is the right fucking answer i don't think that having biden as our candidate is the right answer. Yeah. But people are so afraid. They are. And they're like, why can't we just be like the Republicans for once and yeah. fall in line yeah. and, you know, like stand by our own and quit playing purity politics. And I think that we just have to stop seeing purity politics as our Achilles heel and yeah. start seeing it as our strength. Like, isn't that the thing about like uh, everything in this world? About like like this is a thing that I've lately been trying to like figure out within myself. Yeah. Um but seeing, you know, that your greatest, your greatest strength is often, like, tied to your greatest weakness, your greatest, like, your Achilles heel, you know? Yeah. Like, the thing that makes you, like, special, like, also comes from the thing that you, like, hate the most about yourself. Like, it's, like, the thing that you're, like, trying to reject is, like, the thing that, like, in another light, in another way, you could, like turn into a strength if you learn how to like wield that power correctly yeah you know like that's the thing that's like in so many like superhero you know like comic yeah um, yeah kind of characters right Uh is like the superpower that at first seems like a curse right you know and that like is if you don't know how to wield it correctly it uh can hurt people yeah right yeah like that's like me with my like passion and my like you know fervor like the way that i could like you know reading people out about things like if I can like turn that into a superpower if I can learn how to do that gracefully and more focused and in a way that has compassion yeah that can actually be like my greatest superpower instead of just being like I hate this about myself I'm going to repress it yeah right right well and speaking of superpowers your your voice and your writing so do you think about that when you're writing at all I mean I don't don't think I mean other love songs has millionaire which is a cover right um on it and then and then other than that, though, and that's pretty political, but yeah. um, definitely we actually recorded that before Trump got elected too. that's pretty wild, hoping that it would not be still relevant. That's come pretty November. wild. Yeah. Uh, and sadly, it was. Yeah. Do, but when you when you're writing now, do you think about maybe maybe something overtly political, maybe overt like protest songs? Um, do you write any of that kind of? In, in that way or think about your music in terms of being uh, the superpower that you have, one of the superpowers that you have that you could maybe make an influence with. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And in the past few years, like we, we just recorded a, a whole new record that will be coming out next year. Oh, awesome. In 2020. Um, I did not know that. That's awesome. Yeah. So we have a whole new record in the can. It's all written by me. Um, one song's a co-write between me and our mandolin player, Adam Roscowitz. Uh-huh. Um, and, um, 
I don't, and you know, a lot of people like don't like the term protest song. Sure. I've always loved that term. I love like, it. I've always been all about the protest song. Yeah. Um, I just wrote a piece actually for the bluegrass situation that was like, they asked me to pick my top six protest songs. Oh, cool. And so I did, I was so hard to pick. That'd that be like, fun though. I, I kind of went with more of a personal approach of uh -huh. like songs that I deeply remember affecting me and making me want to write yeah in that style and so there's like ani defranco there's rage against the machine uh, which dope. was completely like what politicized me as like a junior high schooler wow um, listening to rage against the machine going to a concert getting a bunch of pamphlets wow and literally like getting like you know introduced to progressive so you're in junior high and protests. you got to go see rage yeah they're like on my I wish I could have seen them you oh, know dude. list. Yeah, you know? I know I'm so glad that I did. That's it's amazing. 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 And and then so the event itself was like super political in the way that you would kind of hope. Yeah, I mean at least outside. So this is in Oakland at the Oakland Coliseum, which wow. is now the Oracle Arena. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, outside there were just all these people pamphleting, you know? They're like, Yes, young kids that are like you know impressionable. Like getting politicized. <laughs> yeah, impressionable. Like it's just like Fox News would say it was, you yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah. and I'm not mad about it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And it was great. I got all these like pamphlets for like, you know, free Mumia and free Leonard Peltier, like, wow. and like, you know, and it was also, you know, starting, uh, I guess, yeah, it was just, it was, it was sort of just before the whole like 9-11 thing happened. Mm -hmm. And then like, yeah, like, so into high school, like I was really active in like going to protests and stuff and like. So like 9-11 happened when I was in high school and then the ramp up to the Iraq war. And that yeah. was like my senior year of high school when okay. like when the Iraq war started. Yeah. And um, and so I was like, you know, super active and like staging like walkouts. Wow. At our school and like, you know, going to protests, um, you know. Wow. All the like war without end, not in our name stuff. And yeah. Like, uh huh. Um, yeah, so thanks, Rage Against the Machine. So it, you so can trace it back to, to Rage, really. I totally can, especially, yeah. like, being, like, the first protest I ever went to is because of, like, you know, stuff that I learned about from going to that, learning about stuff in the Bay Area that was, like, yeah, you know, that people were organizing around. Right. Um, I can totally relate to that because with Rage specifically yeah. because, like, I did not grow up in San Francisco, right? Mm -hmm. I, I grew up in rural Florida. Mm -hmm. and so, I mean, suburban Florida, really, but a small, small-ish town that's very conservative the son of a conservative politician and so Ooh. i grew up in this totally different world right your dad's a politician yeah he's a former he's a two-term county commissioner wow so i mean he's retired now but like that's intense man yeah he's a two-term um republican I wish he was one of them never trumpers <laughs> i know oh Damn, god man. i know yeah no he says he's the best president uh, in his lifetime oh jesus yeah but um so my journey has been you know just kind of a totally different path and when i first heard rage there was something that resonated with me about the music, right? And the anger, the angst. Because when you get to, when you're in junior yeah. high and oh, you get, so <laughs> and you get rage. Oh, like, yeah. They, yes, they're making the yeah. sounds that I make in my head. Yeah. <laughs> and they're getting paid for it. Yeah. But, the, but the things they were saying were not, no one around me was saying those things. And yeah. so I didn't understand. I still yeah. listened to it because I could relate to the energy of it. But yeah. nothing that they were saying made any sense to me at that time. Like even like some of those that work forces are the same that burn crosses. Oh, my God. Like that's like the line. That's the song that I chose. Yeah, yeah. Because it literally like it's all so these years later, Black Lives Matter, you know, like still saying the still. same thing. And people still don't believe. Right. You know? People still don't believe when, like, the Dallas police, like, say that that witness... Right. Yeah. Yeah. ...got that's shot insane. and just, you know, a botched drug deal, you know, like, yeah. like we believe that. Yeah, right. Like, it's been going on forever. Like, yeah. it really, it really is in, like, you can look at white supremacist message boards and, like, people who study this. Um, yeah. And how, for decades, they've been talking about infiltrating law enforcement military yeah you know yeah trying to like border patrol um putting themselves into power levels as they call it you know yeah. like and hiding themselves in these organizations so that they can you know do what they want they can enact state racist terrorism right so which by the way like is arguably like all that you know state policing has ever been right in the south for sure they the police were started as slave catchers in the South right. generally. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, old habits die hard, I guess. For but, sure. You yeah. Know, like, yeah. So, so that, like, I think that still resonates today. Like, I think that song 
killing in the name it's just yeah. like still resonates today and yeah it's like heartbreaking um but i just really appreciate them i listen to that track again and it's like the track is so fresh still yeah just because uh-huh. it's just like riff rock like people are still doing that it just doesn't feel dated at all uh-uh. everything about it it's just like timeless and like right like the best protest songs are hopefully timeless right so like I've been trying to write protest songs. Okay. These last couple of years. Sorry, I'll be back on track. For I know that's perfect. Here. I'm so glad um, I was about to get you but there, but you did it yourself. So this, I've always I'm been writing protest up. songs like my whole life. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but in the last few years, I've really been like just trying to hone that, you know, and like, especially with the Trump administration, like I kind of veered away from it for a while. And I was like, man, nobody wants to hear just protest songs, you know, like maybe I need to be like working on my own emotional vulnerability and like mm. write about like, you know, feelings and things because that's like not my strong suit right and i'm like trying to like do that but like maybe i was repressing my superpower a little bit right like i was like trying to like run away from it and like when trump got elected i just like felt this renewed energy to like be like no this is like what this is why i'm attracted to this kind of thing like i have a job to do here as a songwriter like i have a duty to like try to write songs that people can use you know um and so I've just been doing that, just trying to be useful um, and also trying to have that grace in the songwriting where you're mm. not just being completely preachy, mm-hmm. where you're like giving people a spoonful of sugar, I guess, with it, you know, like mm. to get that medicine. And, you know, How like what does that look like in, in the process? Um, some of it is like writing songs that can kind of have it both ways that can be like sort of double entendres. Right. And um where it can be you know a relational you know human to human kind of song as well as like a struggle that is more systemic you know um there's a song that's going to be on the new record called broken record um that's like the chorus of it goes if i sound like a broken record you ain't heard me yet Mm. and it's like you know i already heard from like one person who's like man the first time i listened to that it was like a relationship song the second time i listened to it it was like obviously about like protest and about like how like we've been trying to like you know we've been protesting about all these things equal rights you know yeah. like forever you uh-huh. know women's rights the like the wage gap you know yeah yeah forever and it like it's like nobody's listening you know and right. it's like and you know women are like pissed off you know yeah. we had like the me too thing and i think people are done being quiet about this stuff you know right. you're not gonna like put that back in the the box yeah um and i really like that I like how it's like you can you can have like messages that are more universal and hopefully not too toothless like that's mm-hmm. the balance that you have to have you know mm-hmm. so some of the songs are super scathing kind of mm. more classic protest songs there's one called American Dream that that is just about it you know like the refrain goes you're free to believe in the American dream because when you think about freedom in this country it's like you know Yes, we do have a lot of freedoms and sure. liberties that don't exist elsewhere. Yep. It doesn't mean that we're like a perfect union. Right. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't work toward being a more perfect union, you know? Yeah, uh-huh. Right? Sure. Like, um, and I think a lot of people um, use the American dream as this cudgel, you know, especially people who grew up here. I think mm-hmm. it is different for immigrants, mm-hmm. the idea of the American dream. Um, but for people who grow up here it's like it's like they just tell you that you can have this american dream well i graduated from state school state college like right when the recession hit yeah you know and like i'm a millennial you know like i don't think i'm ever gonna buy a house Mm. you know i tour for a living you know like i don't like the american dream that existed for my parents just doesn't exist for me yeah you know Mm. like the jobs aren't there you know the just everything about it man student debt like yeah the it was just completely different from for another generation yeah and yet people are like quiet down like the american dream can be yours if you just quiet down and work hard enough Mm -hmm. and i think that that's like a really insidious myth yeah that keeps people quiet you know just like a lot of things you know like the upper classes have always created these myths yeah myths systems of religion yeah all of these things to sort of like quiet down the peasants right and keep them working yeah. for nothing pretty yeah. much um yeah that's how i feel about that um so the american dream i really don't 
I don't know what people mean when they say that these days. I think they're talking about something from 50 to 70 years ago. Right. Right. Um, so is, is m most of the, uh, the new record in that same vein or like thematically, is it mostly political? I wouldn't say so much political as like just songs of like meaning mm. and like truth. Yeah, but that's what you've been doing. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's like not that different. And I'm like hesitant yeah, yeah, yeah. to call it a record of protest songs. Okay, yeah. But I can say that like how I've been thinking about it is trying to like rethink how we can write the protest song. Right. And whether it can just be like a really positive affirmation song. Like there's this this song that I wrote that you may have actually heard a year and a half ago. I think we, we've been playing it for a little bit now because uh -huh. I wrote it during the kind of Me Too movement. Uh -huh. But... um. Uh -huh. The chorus is just, I hear you, I believe you, I see you. Oh, wow. Like, uh -huh. And I wrote that to be a reminder to myself to respond in the correct way mm -hmm. like to people who are like hurting and telling you about their experience in the world that might be different from yours. And it might be hard to like understand. Um, yeah. But to it's like it means so much to just like believe people to take them at face value and be like that's your experience i believe you you know yeah um if we could all do that more it would be so helpful because that like engages your empathy which right. is the thing that like connects us you know yeah um and so many people just like disbelieve people who have survived trauma uh -huh. and like sexual assault and all kinds of things you know right um and that's like the worst thing you could do is disbelieve somebody when they've been through something right. like that. You know, they're just not going to talk to you anymore. You right. know, and if you want to be a good friend and I learned this by like fucking up and not being the best friend sometimes in the past, you know, sure. Just out of like the stupid things you say when people tell you something that's hard, you know, you always say the wrong thing, yeah. you know, and it's like <laughs> you so can read true. a lot of internet <laughs> articles about like how to say the right thing yeah. to be actually like a good friend and comforting and helpful and like, yeah, yeah. And I just wanted to remind myself about, like, how to do that and how to be there for people in, like, more of a real way, yeah, you know, yeah. and not have to try to fix things, which yeah. is, like, we all do that, you know? So, yeah, it's not, the chorus of that song is not, I'll fix you. Yeah, the, the chorus of the song isn't, like, uh, everything's cool, I'm going to fix it, like, you know, positive vibes only. Right. That's not the chorus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The chorus is just literally like the three things that you can say that are like the most important and like try to like embody is like hearing people, listening more, you know, believing them, taking right. their experience at face value and then just like seeing them and being seen, you know, and just like not like letting each other be like this caricature, you know, but like actually taking people at face value. Right. Um, so that was an example of a song that was just sort of affirmations. And I think that that can be a protest song. You know, if people need that, if they need to hear that in that moment. And it actually did, like, people were immediately, like, coming up after shows and being like, that song meant so much. And, like, That's awesome. And so we've just been playing it a bunch, and it's on the new record. Um, so there's all kinds of protest songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. I'm excited. Do you have a release date for the record? Not yet. Okay. Hopefully the early half of 2020. Okay. Um I want to get out as soon as possible. Yeah. That's going to be difficult. Year. Yeah. It's yeah. like, who knows what the climate's going to be. Like, maybe he'll be impeached by right, that. Right. Yeah. You know? Maybe That's got to be tough when you have that, though. Like, you have this work, right? And it's yeah. ready to go. Like, you probably just want it out there. I, I do. Think. But we have to, like, give it a fighting chance. Sure, sure. So we have to, like, try to find a record label who wants to put it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're working on that. Okay. Trying to just get our decks in a row. Right. Figure out what the release strategy is. Um, but yeah, I'm obviously itching to get it. Yeah, out yeah. Well, I'm itching to hear it. That's 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 awesome. Are you gonna play that song? You guys have a set a little bit later today. Probably will play. I see. Okay. You, I think. Um, cool. Yeah. Awesome. And probably another new one called "Make It Now." Okay. That is off the new record. Um, that is like, the tagline of it is like, "If there is a heaven, can we make it now?" Oh wow. Like, which is kind of a double entendre. Sure. Um. But yeah, it's like, that's like been my philosophy for a long time. Like, I don't know if there's a heaven. Like, right. I don't necessarily believe in that. I kind of think there's not. I think it's, I think it's whatever, like the neurons that fire in your last moments, like 
want it to be. Yeah, uh, you know uh, what I mean? Uh, huh. Like that idea that, you know, there's like, there's these like few seconds of brain activity, electrical activity after you're like actually deceased, yeah. you know, pronounced dead. Um, and it activates like your pineal gland, which is like the part of your brain that makes natural DMT. I don't know. Are you are you have, are you following me here? I am totally following <laughs> you. Some just, listeners yeah. will be following me here. No, I'm so totally following like, you. So there's like there's this whole idea, you know, within like a trip, like time can expand and yeah. contract, especially DMT. Um, and so there's a lot of people who think that like that whatever your construction of you know heaven or the afterlife or whatever that meeting your maker thing is, you yeah. know, if you have that idea that whatever that electrical activity and DMT flooding your brain, uh, the trip that you go on is, you know, dictated by what you believe, what you, you know, that's what really you've prepared for. Yeah, <laughs> that's, I, th- I find that pretty hopeful. You know, I like the thought of that. Um, I don't know. It's, I'm so glad you went there because it's like I, I, have, I talk about this on the show a lot that I have a, f- a fear of my mortality and it manifests itself in a phobia of doctors and needles. And this morning... That's funny. I, I, w- I hate doctor's needles, too, but I, I'm not that afraid of dying. Really? Uh-huh. That's where it all comes from for me. But this morning... It's been a tough day. Like This morning, um, there's a, a dear, sweet woman who can who's our, my friend who camps uh, next to me every year at Swanee. Where I, come, I come both Roots Festivals every year. My father usually comes, but he's had some mobility issues recently, and so it's tough for him to be out here. And this... this this woman that camps with us has become our friend because we camp together. You know, you know, how Swanee is it's that family kind of atmosphere. She fell and broke her shoulder this morning. So I spent the morning in the emergency room with her and broke so her shoulder? she broke uh, her shoulder. Yeah. That's awful. So we had to go to the emergency room and then we went to the, you know, the, the pharmacy. And, and does like that trigger you too? Just being around big it? time. Oh man. Big time. That sucks. But I'm, it's already hard to take care of your health and yep, shit. Yep. Yep. It's huge, but but thankfully I'm I'm really fortunate in that I make an okay living and I have good health insurance and so I can I am in therapy for my for my phobia, you know. So like this conversation, yeah. I might have had to have like canceled this two years ago, you know. Just but to even talk about it. Just to even get here, like to even to even have made it to talk to you after what happened this morning would have been difficult two years ago. Wow. Then when you just brought up the thing about death, I was totally with you and mm-hmm. interested in it. And there were moments of anxiety just then. There were moments, but I was good. I'm all Man, right. That just goes to show you too that like you never know what people are dealing with that yeah. you're talking to. Like, yeah. And that's something too that like I could do well to like remember. Right. When I'm like on a high horse about something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. if I'm talking about like even something just like the afterlife, like I'm always down to talk about everything, you know, yeah, and yeah. like I get really excited about talking about like philosophical stuff like that, but yeah. that that would be like triggering for you. is like something I, I was like totally ignorant to that, you yeah, know, yeah. and like, but I think also, uh, and that's, but that's fine for a lot of reasons, because I think also the fact that it's triggering for me is something that I, ha- that I am actively working on and I should be actively working mm-hmm. on because you can't go through your life. You shouldn't go through your life. I don't think terrified of your own mortality because it's inevitable and so facing it is something that i'm really serious about and that i work really hard on so you don't know that and like you didn't know i was dealing with that and working through that also it's not my experience too so like we all like think everybody's like us yeah that we're talking to you know yes which is a good thing in general for like society cohesion yeah (laughs) be like you're like me i'm like you right that's kind of good for empathy except when that breaks down and people are really different right And, and then you have to like I have to believe you that that's your experience, you know, right. like, even though I can't relate to it. Yes. And that's so true of this particular thing a lot um, where people are like, what? Why are you? S- you're going to yeah. die. Why are you scared of dying? I'm like, that's the dumbest argument I've ever heard. Like, right. You can't possibly relate to like <laughs> how I feel about it, which is like, yeah, I'm scared of like pain. I don't okay. want to die a painful death. Oh, it's not. That, you don't have to keep a No, no, this. it's fine. But, like, Seriously. But, but like when I think about like quick death or anything like that or like you know i don't i don't know i just don't see it's not the, the it idea doesn't bug me the pain doesn't bother me i mean i don't want to obviously go through whatever pain could end my life right but i don't think about that at all hmm. and with the needle it's not pain like i have a decently high so what is it is pain it the threshold empty for blackness yeah. at the other side 100 percent. it's the uh, it's the not knowing my, Dude. Ther- my therapist says it's a con- it's a control issue for me <laughs> it's that i don't have any control over it and that excuse me as a result um that i my anxiety creates 
something like this, the nothingness, right? Yeah. Like it does seem like, so when you were talking about reincarnation earlier, yeah. I read a book. Oh, I wish I could think of the name of it. I read it about two years ago and it totally shifted my thinking about this. Um, yeah, you need philosophy, man. That's what you need. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a minor in philosophy. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> You're like, I already tried that. Yeah, I made studied, it worse. I philosophy in college. Yeah, I started reading, started reading okay. Kant and got all fucked up. Yeah, um, Nietzsche didn't help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I couldn't. I didn't go down that road. <laughs> Hardly at all because I wasn't ready for that. Well, that but, whole DMT thing is, like, really interesting, actually, in the way that people talk about afterlife theories with DMT. Yeah. I find it so fascinating. There's yeah. this book the spirit molecule dmt the spirit molecule okay. by uh i forget what his name is richard something i think um is that offensive the spirit molecule <laughs> spirit <laughs> molecule <laughs> no no okay i think he's fairly respectful too in talking about like you know it's like the active ingredient in ayahuasca yeah yeah uh-huh. um ayahuasca does interest me there are people that believe that like that tripping on dmt actually prepares you yeah for the afterlife situation mm-hmm and that you like can can sort of train mm-hmm. to like be able to be present when that happens right like at death yeah um i don't know you know how i feel about that there's people who tie it into like the tibetan book of the dead mm-hmm. um and ideas there and um yeah and then, i don't know there's other people too who think that like that taking dmt is visiting that realm before you're supposed to and is disrespectful Oh, that's interesting. And that's like another sort of theory. That's not, by the way, this is not like in the book. This is just from like interviews I've listened to and like yeah. people, you know, friends. And um, I've not done it, but for some reason I've always been obsessed. Like when I was in junior high, I had like this like book about LSD. I was just always obsessed with like, yeah, you know, psychoactive uh, stuff. And like I definitely like did some stuff later, you know, in college. But like, but I've just always been obsessed with like, uh, you know, altered states of consciousness. And like when I was a kid, I was like reading about like astral projection and meditation and like hippie stuff, you know, yeah. and, like um, and like dream, like guided dream meditation and stuff. I was like this weird kid that was like That's really obsessed I was just, with stuff I was like listening, that. I heard something about that recently, the guided dream meditation. Have you th- does that stuff, uh, whether it whether it was drugs or it was meditation or whatever, has has any of that informed your creative process at all? Has it improved your creative process or impacted it in any way? That's hard to say, you know. Um, I don't think it has. And, in fact, I kind of, like, I don't know. I'll take mushrooms every couple of years. Mm-hmm. Like, a couple of years, like, every, like, freaking ten years at this point, probably. Oh, I don't know, really? Maybe five. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But, like. So, not often. But when I need to, like, get the message or something or, like, sort of reconnect to the lack of ego thing, you know. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like good for me in that way. It's like therapeutic. Um, but I don't think like every time I've like taken mushrooms or even honestly like marijuana, I can't, I can't do it. I can't write. Yeah. I can't be creative. Like in a way I can be at flow. Yeah. Like sense. Like I can jam. Oh, okay. I have a lot of fun like jamming. Sure. Sure. Um, but like actually like writing a song or something, I have to have like both sides of my brain. Yeah. There. Like, I like to think about, like, um, creativity with songwriting as, like, there's, like, two sides. There's, like, the inspiration and the perspiration side. Uh. Or, like, there's, like, the, like, you know, flow, stream of consciousness, creativity side, and then the craft side. Yeah. Right? And it's, like, your, like, right brain and left brain. Sure. You know? And that you sort of want to, like, be in the inspirational space, but then at some point you have to switch over to the editor, the crafty side. Yeah. You know, that's, like, actually controlling and, like, making it into something cohesive that that people can understand right right like we've all heard music and stuff that is like too much of one or the other yeah you know uh for sure it's too controlled yeah you know and too calculated yeah and then we've heard stuff too that's like too stream of consciousness yeah too much flow bro like let's get you back to (laughs) earth right like um so i think you need a balance of those two things and i think that like being on drugs of any kind puts me too much in the right Uh. brain sort of creative flowy side of things yeah um, and i can't like use my editor side i think yeah that's interesting i think that's true for a lot of people i know i can't do hardly anything i i don't i, I can't like i just can't do marijuana like it just doesn't agree with me i'm so I'm, sorry i'm just i know i know i'm, <laughs> I'm envious of you, uh, you folks well, no can. i can't drink drink like alcohol oh, really? does not react well with me at all like okay. it never has i don't think i metabolize it right or yeah, something yeah. like it just doesn't makes me sleepy yeah uh kind of like yeah it just doesn't 
it's not good. And I don't really need a lack of inhibition either because I'm right. <laughs> already like extra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's just not good for me. And it probably also comes from like, oh, you know, family members who like it too much, yep. you know, mm -hmm. and sort of getting turned off to that as a kid too. Um, oh, that's interesting. I'm sure that's part of it too. But, um, but it's just never been my best friend. And that's some people it's the best thing. But yeah. for me, honestly, like, and I, hardly ever smoke weed because i'm a singer and i'm on tour constantly yeah. and i just can't mess with my health on tour at yeah, all uh -huh. um but i would say the marijuana would be like my choice between those two for sure so like it definitely jibes with me better it makes me a happier nicer right. person <laughs> yeah yeah um and it makes me chill out so when you're touring are you pretty much sober yeah yeah stone cold yeah that's great yeah it's i mean i'm not messing around it's like I'm yeah I don't see how it's sustainable otherwise. Yeah. You know, I'm not like, I'm not like a workout junkie or anything, you sure. know, like too. So I'm not like, I'm not doing things on the road that are going to like mitigate bad things that I do on the road necessarily. Yeah. So I just try to go with harm reduction <laughs> and like being able to sleep, being yeah. able to sing, sure. being able to do my job. It makes me really unhappy if I can't perform like I want to. Sure. So that's what it's all about. Right. So I try to like hold a sacred space for that and just not, um, I don't, I don't party on the road right. which makes me kind of like not fun you know <laughs> i'm not like the festival musician who's yeah. like gonna at the campfire be at the campfire all night Pick and like circle. that's just not me yeah yeah and i like it's not sustainable for me and i know other people who can do it yeah and they're just like super hardy you know hardy partiers yeah. who can do that and that's just never been me i'd be sick for weeks i can't stay i never go i've done it once or twice gone to the circles and just hung out and yeah. you know and whatever once or twice maybe i've been coming here for years mm -hmm. and years and years because i'm with i'm with you like i gotta i need my sleep i need to make sure i'm taking care of myself i will have a handful of drinks after i finish all of my work today mm -hmm. but um but you probably like drinking it's just never i do been like drinking like, yeah it's never been my and best I know friend it. you know what i mean like i've and I wasn't always my best friend and I got through, I did some really stupid shit and I, you know, got through all of that to a place where now I, I know it right now. I, and, and with marijuana, I never got to that place. Like mm -hmm. I just immediately have an existential crisis and a panic attack. I had a lot of practice. <laughs> really? uh, I went to school in Humboldt County, uh -huh, in California, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the heyday. Nobody, and, yeah. where I was from, the kids who smoked, who smoked pot were like, it wasn't, nobody did in my high school and the people who did were like we didn't take them seriously they were like mm -hmm. the burnouts that we didn't take seriously right and so if you wanted to like you know i wanted a girlfriend and i wanted to play sports <laughs> oh my god and if i wanted those things <laughs> you couldn't you couldn't smoke weed in my high school you could probably do beer bongs though or something oh yeah like, we drank we drank too much yeah, yeah like yeah. But how does that not make you a loser <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, I I anyway, I our know. culture is so messed up. It, yeah, there's like, we could that be a whole nother podcast, but you've given me more time than I could possibly ask for, and I'm so grateful. This was so much fun. Oh, it's all good, dude. Is Thank there, you. Is there anything else that we actually have to talk about? Not like, really, unless you want to talk about anything in particular. I usually end with, the one thing is I usually end five, with. Five, ten more. All right, cool. Um, I'm supposed to catch up with Verlin Thompson, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. We did not plan where or when, and I don't have his phone number, so... <laughs> Um, well, we can wrap it up for all sure. Right, well, let me just. I really this. appreciate you. This is a really good talk. Thank you. Likewise, this was awesome. Um, the way we. Use I don't go to therapy myself, so this was really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I highly recommend it. <laughs> um, it seriously, that that's one of the best decisions I ever made was was finally going. And I think I, I never had like a stigma in my head about it. Um, my parents both encouraged me to go, but um, I had a two years ago, right before Swanee, actually, I had a health issue. And um, I had to have surgery, and it was just like test after test after test anxiety, and surgery, and yeah. the anxiety was just through the roof. And I was in an abusive work relationship, like that my job was, I didn't realize that then. Mm -hmm. I just thought of it as like not ideal. Now I know that they were, it's an abusive work environment I was working yeah. in. And uh, so then I just started going to therapy, and it's just amazing how much better I feel. But we always end on um, <laughs> what, <laughs> we always end on what you're consuming at the moment, uh, art-wise. like. Is there uh, a band you're fired up about or, like, a show you're fired up about or a book? You mentioned a few books already, but is there anything that you're, like, super fired up about at the moment that's inspiring you? I'm so you? bad at being put on the spot about these things. <laughs> what have I been obsessed with lately? And it's not a, you know, if you don't have anything. I mean, this is going to sound so basic, but, uh, I mean, like, because everyone is obsessed with Lizzo. Oh, well, but yeah, but so what? I'm... I'm pretty well obsessed with Lizzo. Yeah. I think that, like, the way that she's just infectiously um, created this, like, Trojan horse of body positivity uh -huh. blended into, like, pop music. 
Yeah, yeah. I just love that. Yeah. I love that she has like such a message. Yeah. And she's always talking about it, and she's always just like showing up and representing it by being herself. Like, mm. this mm. is, you know, she talks a lot about therapy and mental health as well, and yeah. that's so, so great. Like, I think it yeah. really inspires people to get the help they need and not feel stigmatized. And, right. Um, and she's such a great example of that thing of like using something that you know you've been made fun of for your whole life that right. you've tried to like kill within yourself like being fat yeah you know i'm like a bigger girl like who has never been somebody who like wants to like starve myself and stuff but i have felt very shitty about my body uh -huh. you know and she's just so inspiring with that because she talks about how like you know that's just the way that she's made and she really had to like do radical self-love and like really like that's so much harder than it sounds you know like yeah. to actually like program yourself to reprogram yourself to think positively about your body however it looks you know like however you're built and accept yourself like truly and completely and she talks about it all the time and i think just think it's so positive and by doing that she even talks about this like she turned like something that would be considered her weakness, mm -hmm. you know, that she probably considered her weakness at one point, which right. was like being a big girl, you know, and turned it into like the most fabulous, positive superpower. Yeah. Where it is her superpower. And she shows up as herself fully and completely as this big girl. Right. And she's like, are we still recording? I hope so. That'd be hilarious. If we didn't record the whole thing, but it still would have been worthwhile. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been doing this thing recently. I think because I've been going longer, mm -hmm. I think it just started a new track. Oh, right. Is what it did. Um, like, does it end about like 30 minutes or Yeah, I think hour? it goes to like an hour and then it starts a new track. Um, so it just mm -hmm. likes to give me a little anxiety attack. Yeah, See, yeah. again, okay. therapy. Yeah, you're I'm freaking good. out. It's fine. It's fine. Anyway, Lizzo is Lizzo. my recommendation. She's just like, you're going to love it. You're going to like feel better about your body and yeah. yourself and like you're gonna like if you want you can consider the idea of like radical self-love and what right. that actually means and she talks about it really eloquently all the time she's always talking about it and i think i'm starting to get what she means that's you know? awesome about like really creating your own superpower yeah by by loving yourself completely and not repressing the parts of you that you thought were like the worst yeah that's awesome. That's a perfect place to end it. Melody, thank you so much. Yeah, This thanks. was such a pleasure. Yeah. I've been writing your letters, trying to make it all all right. But every time we fight, it feels like a goodbye. And it feels like if everything ceased to exist, we'd be left with the memory of this. And I'm not going to let it go down. y'all thank you so much for your time and energy melody thank all of you for listening melody and i covered a ton of ground as you heard and i'm so grateful for her time and art the song you're hearing in this episode is i don't want to die angry from front country's album other love songs uh, i feel like it showcases melody's vocal talents and uh, songwriting as well just a powerful powerful song and and um their records are full of, of songs like that. If you're not familiar, head over to frontcountryband.com or look them up wherever you consume music. Um, don't miss them when they come to your town, y'all. Uh, I'm telling you, I mentioned that in the intro, and I'll say it again and again and again. They're so good live. You can find all things Marinade at marinadepodcast.com. Follow us on social media for updates. We are especially active on Twitter and Instagram. Um, if you really like what we're doing, please consider joining our Patreon community. You can get access to Patreon-exclusive content like our patron-only podcast, Jason's Journey, where I talk about the moments that have shaped my creative life. That's at patreon.com slash marinadepodcast. Um, if you aren't ready or able to do that, just tell a friend about the show um, give us a rating on your podcast app. Every time you hit like on a social media post or share one of ours, 
especially if it's um, a link to an episode. It makes a big difference, y'all, and we greatly appreciate it. All right, y'all, it's time for what I'm getting down on, the segment where I share the art that I'm consuming at the moment. Um, I am so crazy, so fired up about Kelsey Walden's record, White Noise, White Lines. This is a, the finest in country music, y'all. It is, um, it's so good, and I'm stoked that Kelsey will be here in Orlando on my birthday, opening for John Prine, no less. Um, just that record, uh, if you're listening to the show, you probably have listened to it, but if you haven't, or if it's been a while, go back and check it out. Um, I have also been reading Dostoevsky's, uh, crime and punishment, which is a book that I avoided for a long time. Um, I'm not really sure why, I guess like I felt like it was daunting. Um, but I wish I'd read it earlier. Maybe it just found me at the right time. It's been sitting on my shelf for a long time. A friend gave it to me, um, years ago. It's just been sitting on a shelf collecting dusk. Uh, I don't know what it says about me, but this one's a page turner to me. It, it deals pretty heavily with grief and guilt in a way that few works I've read are able to accomplish, um, and I love it. Uh, I've also been kind of like rereading Watchmen uh, because I've been watching the series and listening to the official podcast, and I was kind of on the fence about the HBO series Watchmen uh, because while it's definitely true to the source material, it's certainly very different. Um, and at first I kind of felt like, uh, I do with, with, with works, uh, I don't want to use the word derivative, but, but works that are based on something else. Um, oftentimes I feel like, well, why didn't you just call it something different? You know? Um, but now I get it. So I've been listening to the official podcast, which is, um, with the showrunner, but it's hosted by Craig Mazin, who's the guy who did Chernobyl, um, which I raved and raved about, uh, a few episodes ago. I've long been a fan of Watchmen, and so it took rereading pieces of the novel and then listening to the companion podcast to really get into the show, and I'm no longer on the fence. I recommend uh, watching the show. If you haven't read the book, definitely read the book first. Um, I recommend listening to the companion podcast while you um, while you watch the show, um, and uh, it, it's just really been, it's got me fired up. The most recent episode, uh, when this comes out, I believe episode five I just watched last night, uh, is just outstanding, y'all. Just, just really, really well done. I appreciate y'all so much. This was an amazing conversation. Uh, I'm going to get out of here now because this is one of the longer ones, and thanks for sticking around. Um, we have so much content, y'all. Uh, I, ha- I ran into a technical problem that held me back for a little while, but we've got another bonus episode, two full-length episodes, um, an interview scheduled this coming Saturday, and then an interview uh, that we're trying to nail down the, the exact time of next weekend. So really great creatives coming up, really great conversations. Until next time, go out and create something. Cheers, y'all.